Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to the channel. Let's address the elephant in the room. I did black out in the decorative lighting section of a Walmart and I know it looks bad. Like I do, I, I fully am internalizing that, but I've got to film this video and I've been messing with it for like two hours. So please comment and tell me what I should do to fix this situation we've got going on here. Okay, today's video, we're doing our Eclipse analysis. Eclipse to me really is the Edward versus Jacob book. Here's the way I see it, okay? Twilight is the Edward book, New Moon is the Jacob book, Eclipse is the Edward versus Jacob book, and Breaking Dawn is a sleep paralysis nightmare. So the book opens with a poem, Fire and Ice by Robert Frost. Some say the world will end in- <laughs> Already proving I can't read. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction ice is also great and would suffice. Robert Frost. Now, if you've been following along in our Twilight series, then you would know that Twilight has a quote from Genesis in the beginning and New Moon has a quote from Romeo and Juliet in the beginning. And in both of those books, Genesis was a heavy theme inspiration for the original Twilight and New Moon is in a way a Romeo and Juliet retelling, although it is a very loose adaptation. Not a perfect like plot by plot story retelling, but inspiration, metaphors, the whole like. In this book, the interesting thing is that Wuthering Heights is actually more the story story inspiration. I will admit to you now, I have not read Wuthering Heights. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. That book is notorious for being very confusing and I got confused reading a plot summary of it. So I can't imagine reading the actual book. But the important thing to know is that in theory, there's a love triangle, but it's not really a love triangle. Kathy and Heathcliff love each other, but Heathcliff overhears Kathy says something and misunderstands it and like runs off for three years. And so she marries someone while he's gone and then he comes back and wants to be with her, but she's already married to somebody else. Obviously a bit of a spoiler for even my own video video here, but I am assuming that if you're watching this, that you probably are somewhat familiar with the plot of these books. Also full spoilers for the book for this whole video. <laughs> if you don't want a clip spoiled, do not watch this video any further. This is kind of what's happened up to now. I don't know if this was accidental on Stephanie Meyer's part or if she always intended to relate it to Wuthering Heights, but Edward and Bella are in love. Edward left for a time. And in that meantime, Bella started spending a lot of time with Jacob and then Edward comes back. But now Jacob is upset about this and he still wants to stake a claim on Bella, if you will. This kind of furthers my point that I've been making, which is that Stephanie Meyer claims that Jacob had a chance with Bella, but it really doesn't feel that way when you read the books. Like it doesn't really feel like Jacob was ever an actual option for Bella. And even here with this comparison, if Jacob is supposed to be Edgar, I believe his name is, maybe incorrect. I do believe it starts with an E though. Then still, he never really had a chance. To be fair, she did say that by the time she wrote Eclipse, she knew for a fact that Bella was going to end up with Edward. But I still think it's crazy in hindsight that she said in an interview that the way that New Moon ended dictated to her whether or not Bella ended up with Edward or Jacob. And that at that point in time, it was still possible that she actually ended up with Jacob. I just don't see it. I don't see it, but I was a team Edward girly, so I could be biased. But my point is that this is supposed to be in a way loosely related to Wuthering Heights. You might be wondering, how did you know that if she didn't start with a quote of it and you've never read Wuthering Heights and also it's such a loose connection? Well, they reference Wuthering Heights a few times in the book very similarly to how they do Romeo and Juliet in New Moon, where Bella is reading it and Edward talks about the plot of it a little bit and he kind of hates on the character that he is supposed to be within the book. It's very meta in that way. And near the end, Edward says something about kind of feeling for Heathcliff and Bella opens the book and like reads a quote. And it's very clear that it is supposed to be in comparison to Wuthering Heights. So the addition of this poem is really interesting because you would think if she was following the pattern of the past two books, that she would have opened the book with a quote from the reference material. She did not do that. She opened it with this poem instead. So let's talk about the poem. This poem discusses the potential end of the world. The narrator of this poem is very flippant about the end of the world. Their language is very casual throughout the poem and especially at the end. And they're essentially musing about how the world would end. They agree with a lot of people saying that knowing the destructive power of fire, it's more likely to end in fire. But if the world had to end twice, then this narrator believes that ice would also suffice as a way to end the world. Very strange poem. So I'm just going to relate it to Twilight. <laughs> if, if we're all good with that, I'm not going to do a poem deep dive. I'm just going to relate it to the book. I at first very naively and very incorrectly assumed that Jacob was going to be the fire and Edward was going to be the ice. 
Because Jacob's body temperature runs higher than that of a human's. He's a werewolf, by the way, if you weren't aware. Edward's body temperature runs at a lower temperature than a human's. Much lower. He's very often described by Bella as being ice cold and of granite. He's like a stone fire ice, right? But that just didn't feel right. And as I was reading the book, it just continued to not really feel like what Stephanie Meyer meant. Why did she put this in here? Because it was clearly very intentional. And the thought occurred to me there. I have two theories. The first is that if we think of the end of the world as the end of Bella's human life, the end of Bella's world as she knows it, if you will, then Victoria, who is kind of one of the big bads of this book, with her fiery orange hair, could be seen as the fire, as the potential end of Bella's life. Whereas her plan to get transformed into a vampire by the Cullens is also an end to her human life, but is a much more ice cold and calculated way for it to be done. Bella is very casual and very flippant through this book about the ending of her human life and towards the end she does start to freak out a little bit but it's towards the end like through the book she's very like okay I'm getting turned into a vampire after graduation and I'm ready for it and and it's coming and and it's gonna happen and there's a point where she kind of is like oh wait that's actually a really big deal but it's not until much later in the book. So this kind of goes to support that with the flippant nature of the poem, that she's kind of staring down these two possible ends of her life. Not only that, but the Victoria stuff honestly takes a back seat in this book. I was surprised by how little of the book is actually about the attack from Victoria, because that's the thing that everybody remembers. Or maybe I shouldn't speak for you guys. That's the thing I remember about this book. This book is almost 500 pages long. And very little of it is actually dedicated to this whole Victoria thing. Most of it is a Jacob versus Edward. So in a way, Bella's being a little bit flippant about the Victoria stuff in the perspective that she is showing us because we're within her head. Whenever she thinks about this potential attack, they don't know for a fact that it's Victoria at first. She does get very nervous. She does get very scared. But as we're watching the story through her eyes, she does not seem to think about it as often as she thinks about this whole Jacob versus Edward situation. So in a way, she's kind of flipping about both of these things. So you can see how Victoria is maybe the fire, the potential end of her life, while the other potential end to her human life is being turned into a vampire by the Cullens, which would be more the ice. My other theory is instead, if you remember, if you watch my new moon video, both Bella and Edward suffer symbolic ego deaths at the end of that book. If you want more explanation on that, you gotta go watch the video. But in my opinion, they both suffer these symbolic ego deaths and the idiocy that put them in that situation is the fiery passion of young love and so one could also argue that that is the fire death because the poem references if the world had to end twice maybe the ego death that bella suffers in new moon is her first death that is a death of fire while her human death becoming a vampire is her second death which is made of ice do you see what i'm getting at are you picking up what i'm putting down just put it down there are you picking it up? You guys always tell me if you think I'm super off base, so I'm sure you will, but please comment and let me know what you think about that because I'll admit, I was pretty proud when I thought of that second theory. I, I thought I was pretty clever. Oh, I have a quote to kind of support the Victoria Fire theory. On page 441, at least of my copy, it said, her orange hair was brighter than I remembered, more like a flame. There was no wind here, but the fire around her face seemed to shimmer slightly as if it were alive. There's more support of it being Victoria that's supposed to be the fire, but... I'm leaning towards the second theory only because I want to be right about the ego death thing. I want to feel smart. Let me have this, okay? Well, you're not going to. If you disagree with me, you are going to tell me and I know that. All of this to say the actual plot of the book is supposed to be a loose mirror to Wuthering Heights and all of the references within the book are mostly to Wuthering Heights. The book actually starts with a handwritten note from Jacob where a bunch of sentences are started and cut off and then crossed out on the page. And the end of the note simply says, yeah, I miss you too a lot. Doesn't change anything. Thing. Sorry. What a 2014 edgelord way to begin this book. And I'm complimenting her for that because that is her demographic. At the time that this book came out, her demographic for this book is 13 to 17 year old girls. And this, at the time that this book came out, would have very much fit in with the edgelord Tumblr culture of the time. Remember that canonically Bella is 18 years old at this time. She's about to graduate high school and she lives with her dad, Charlie, in Forks, Washington. If you have never read these books and have not watched my other videos, I will give you a two second explanation of everything else. Jacob is a werewolf. Edward is a vampire. Edward has a vampire family that he lives with that all refuse to drink human blood and instead live off of animal blood. Edward and Bella are in love, but Edward left for a while because he thought he was protecting Bella and Bella got really close with Jacob while he was gone and now Edward is back and there is a love triangle. Also, there's this woman named Victoria that wants to kill Bella because in the first book, Edward killed Victoria's mate. 
James because he was trying to kill Bella. If you're confused, I don't know what to tell you. She was grounded at the end of the last book for her antics, in my opinion, a justified grounding. But at the beginning of this book, Charlie ungrounds her on the condition that she spend more time with her other friends besides Edward, because in his opinion, she spends way too much time with Edward. Charlie wants her to hang out with more of her other friends and specifically mentions Jacob. Bella tries to tell Charlie that her and Jacob aren't on good terms, but Charlie insists that Jacob is like family because Charlie is so close with Jacob's dad and him and Bella kind of interacted some growing up. He's like, Jacob's like family. Can you please make up this fight? Can you please figure it out? Figure out what the two of you have to say to each other to become friends again. Side note, this scene starts with Charlie microwaving an entire jar of spaghetti sauce with the lid on the jar still. Bella kind of runs down the stairs when she hears the microwave going because she's this terrified of Charlie operating any of the kitchen appliances. Sees that he's microwaving with the lid on and pulls the jar out of the microwave to obviously take the lid off. And when Charlie asks her about it, she says that metal is bad for microwaves. Now, if you've ever accidentally put metal in the microwave, you would know that it is the opposite. Microwaves are not good for metal. In my humble opinion, I don't think that jar is intact, by the time Bella gets to it. The only reason this makes me angry is because I also have a father who would burn soup. Let me defend that man because he he does know not to put metal in the microwave. Like he's not that stupid. And this not only felt disrespectful to Charlie and his intelligence, but also just not realistic. If Charlie is that bad a cook, then I can almost guarantee that he knows his way around a microwave. Bella has this insistence to go visit Jacob, despite the fact that Jacob has made it very clear that he does not want to see or talk to Bella. He will not answer her phone calls and he begrudgingly answered a note that she snuck him through Charlie. Bella is still insistent that she needs to go see Jacob but Edward does not want to allow it because he thinks it's dangerous for her to be around such fresh werewolves who are going to have trouble controlling themselves. This is the beginning of Edward's controlling arc. Beginning? Eh, it's kind of been there. We know that. But this is where it gets really bad. He is insistent through the entire first half of this book that Bella is not to go visit Jacob at any point. Table that? Remember that. We'll come back to that. I did my best to get the order of this correct. Okay, I just wanted to give you a heads up. I do not want a repeat incident of the whole PETA in District 2 situation. So if I get something tiny wrong, I don't care. You don't have to tell me. I'm pretty sure the order goes like this. We find out that there's a murder spree going on in Seattle at the time, which is close to Forks, Washington. Alice has a suspicious vision that Edward assures Bella is about Jasper. Edward convinces Bella to go to Florida to visit her mom using the tickets that Carlisle and Esme gave her for her 18th birthday. They go to Florida for the weekend. They come back and Jacob hears that Bella was out of town for a few days and calls her worried that she has now become a vampire, is relieved to find out that she's still human. And while they're on the phone talking about it, Bella drops that she's not allowed to go see Jacob because Edward won't let her. The next day at school, Jacob shows up to Bella's school where him and Edward have a little bit of a confrontation in the parking lot, which is on the surface about an incident that happened while Bella was out of town, but of course is also about their mutual love for Bella. The incident, which Bella was not aware of, was that everybody was on the boundary line for some reason and the wolves and the vampires almost had a run in until somebody calmed down the situation. I think it was Jasper. Bella, of course, is like, why was everybody on the boundary line? And Jacob's like, oh my God, you didn't tell her. And Edward's like, yeesh. And she finds out that Victoria is back and that Edward lied to her about it. That jerk, we hate him right now. Also, canonically, at this point, Jacob is six foot seven. And yet when the kids at the school are betting over which of them would win in a fight, people are taking Edward in that bet. I do not get that. We, the reader, know that Edward is a vampire. We know that on one-on-one -on -one battles, the vampires are stronger than the werewolves and it's hard for one werewolf to kill one vampire, especially a vampire as quick and as old as Edward is. But the other kids at the school don't know that. So if Jacob is canonically six foot seven, why would any single one of them think that Edward has a chance against him? We don't know how tall Edward is, okay? I don't know if we've ever been told. If we have been, please comment and tell me. But I don't think we've ever been told exactly how tall Edward is the way we've been told exactly how tall Jacob is. So for fairness's sake, we have to put him at the men's average, which is five foot ten. If he is five foot ten, there is no way on planet Earth that anybody thought that he could take Jacob, who again, I'll reiterate, is canonically six foot seven. So either Edward is taller and we just haven't been told that or these boys are idiots and bad gamblers oh my god i'm so little into the script for how long i've been filming oh typo alert typo alert i found a typo it's just always fun i don't really care but i just enjoy it it's just a fun little easter egg almost except this one is weird 
I don't know why I did that like that. Page 74 in these white copies. My understanding is it's a different page in the black copies. I don't remember what page exactly. You can see the word frowning is missing the O. Interesting. Here's the thing that's interesting. This typo does not exist in the black copies of this book. This is the special of white print that comes in a box set. I bought them for this video. I'm rereading these copies specifically for this video and marking them up. This typo does not exist in the original print of this book. That is so weird. That is so confusing to me because it's not like they retype the manuscript for a new print. Oh, we want to do a special print of Twilight. We've got to set some intern on retyping the entire series. Like, of course not. So how is it that a typo appeared in this one that didn't appear in the last one? If they had fixed a typo that was in the original print, that would make perfect sense. How are we missing an O? Where did it go? I'm like truly actually fascinated by this. If any of you are in publishing and you know how it's possible that a new print of a book could end up missing one single letter, please let me know because I'm driving myself crazy trying to figure out exactly how that happened. From here on out, I'm not going to be covering the book chronologically because believe it or not, I actually think it would make more sense this way. Like I kind of already said, the Victoria and the vampire side of things takes a backseat to the love triangle in this book. And so it can be very disjointed recounting the plot because pieces of information are revealed as we go about what's happening in the background with the whole Victoria situation and the newborn vampire army. But it's just not really relevant to anything that happens in the first three quarters of this book. We're just going to talk about Edward and Jacob for a while, okay? Edward and many of the other Cullens go out of town hunting. Alice stays within 15 minutes of a vampire speed run of Forks in order to stop Bella from ever going to visit Jacob because Edward really doesn't want her to go visit them because the werewolves are dangerous and he's controlling. So Bella knows that Alice is nearby. So if Bella decides to go visit Jacob, Alice will see this in one of her visions or I guess stop seeing Bella's future because Alice actually can't see the wolves in her visions. So Alice will stop seeing Bella's future if she decides to go visit Jacob and Bella knows this. She thinks she has a shift at work that day, but her shift actually gets canceled. So as she's walking out of the building, she sees a wolf poster and she makes the split second decision to go visit Jacob then, which means that that's right when Alice would have found out that she was going to visit Jacob because Alice's visions depend on the choice that the person is making about their own future. So Bella makes a split second decision to go visit Jacob and this allows her to get over the boundary line for the treaty before Alice can get to her. So she has successfully snuck out of Forks and into La Push, and she is visiting her friend Jacob on the reservation. All of the stuff that I said about the representation of Native Americans in this book series in the last video is very much still true of this book. I didn't want to make it sound like I was just being flippant about it, but I also don't really want to recap all the same stuff that I said in that video. So if you want to know more about that, go check out that video. She spends the day with Jacob where he's just absolutely in denial over the fact that she is back dating Edward now that Edward is back. He honestly comes across as a bit of a jerk at points in this part. And even Bella gets really mad at him and is sulking and almost leaves. Part of what stops her from leaving is her fear of knowing that Edward is probably going to be back in Forks and probably going to be very upset with her. And she doesn't quite want to go back to that yet. And so she gets really frustrated with Jacob at points in this interaction, but she doesn't leave because she's scared to go home. And I really just felt for her in this situation. These boys suck. They suck. They suck so bad and they're treating her so poorly right now. And she's caught between a rock and the hard place because Jacob can't take no for an answer. And Edward is like an over controlling asshole and she's like afraid to go home to him. So right now, adult mayor is team neither of these motherfuckers. Okay. Bella gets back to Forks at the end of hanging out with Jacob, where as you can guess, Edward is very angry at her. Yay. Thank you, Edward. You're so predictable. So the next time that he leaves town because he needs to hunt so that he does not go crazy and eventually kill a human, he has Alice fully kidnap Bella, hold her against her will inside of the Cullen house. That is a real thing that actually happens in this book. Bella is a prisoner at the Cullen house because Edward does not want her sneaking off to visit Jacob. At some point, Bella and Jacob get on the phone where Bella tells him that she's not allowed to come visit him. They had plans, I'm pretty sure. But she tells him that she's not allowed to come visit him because Edward had Alice kidnap her. So Jacob shows up at Bella's school to pick her up when she shows up for school and takes her on his motorcycle to La Push, where she ditches school and spends the day with Jacob. Edward realizes that controlling Bella isn't going to work. 
And that actually he's driving her to do more and more insane actions in an attempt to get around him and that it would be much safer for her to just go visit Jacob. No amount of convincing from him is going to really get into Bella's head that werewolves can be dangerous. And so he's got to allow her to go see Jacob because that's what she wants and she needs to be able to make the choices for herself. But that's not the only reason. The other reason he changes his mind about being okay with her to visiting Jacob is that she calls him out on it maybe being jealousy. This growing from a girl talk conversation with Angela where she obviously left out all the werewolf vampire stuff. Bella accuses Edward of over-exaggerating how dangerous he thinks the werewolves are because he is jealous of her spending time with Jacob. And Edward admits that this is correct and changes his mind about allowing Bella to visit Jacob. So for a while, we see Bella spending time with Edward and them being romantic together and mostly them arguing about whether or not they want to get married. And when I say arguing, I mean Edward wants to get married and Bella doesn't because she doesn't want to be seen as one of those people who gets married right out of high school. She'd rather everyone in the hometown just know that the two of them went off to college together and not know what happened to their relationship after the fact. She'd rather the town not think that the two of them got married because she doesn't want to be seen as one of those small town girls that does such a thing. Edward, on the other hand, really badly wants Bella to marry him, wants to do it while she's a human, but isn't going to stop her from becoming a vampire if she's not willing to marry him. His ultimatum is that he will transform her into a vampire himself if she marries him first. Now, I do not consider this to be one of the controlling things from Edward. This is, in my opinion, an example of how actual boundaries work. Edward, in my opinion, is setting a boundary here. Hear me out. Edward is talking about himself and his own behavior. He is saying, I do not want to turn you into a vampire unless you marry me. However, he's not trying to control her behavior here. He is perfectly okay with her becoming a vampire at Carlisle's hand. And so if she wants to become a vampire and she doesn't want to marry him, then she has a route to do that by having Carlisle be the one to do it. Edward is putting a boundary down of what he wants to do. He does not want to turn her into a vampire himself unless they are married. I feel like this is fair. Just my opinion. Just my opinion. I'm going to rag on Edward for a while in a second. But in, in my opinion, in this situation, this is just him saying this is the compromise. But if you want to become a vampire, you're more than welcome. Just ask Carlisle. So we get an overarching montage. Things are kind of going crazy in the background with all the vampire stuff. We'll get to that later in the video. Bella and Edward are spending a lot of time together where they are continuously having this debate about possibly getting married because Bella really does want Edward to be the one to turn her. And Bella continues to visit Jacob in La Push and spend time with him, where Jacob continues to not be able to take no for an answer and understand that Bella has no romantic interest in him. Eventually, Jacob fully assaults her. He kisses her without her permission. She punches him. And then, to quote the movie, And she broke her hand, punching my face. Is that a funny line? Yes. Is this very shitty from Jacob? Also, yes. Now, I feel comfortable really ragging on Jacob here because as a part of my research for this video, I was perusing the Team Jacob subreddits, and it seems that my Team Jacob girlies out there are in agreement that Jacob's behavior in this book, specifically as it pertains to his inability to take no for an answer and his assaults of Bella, are unacceptable, and that the Jacob that they're in love with is the Jacob from New Moon, not the Jacob from Eclipse. So I actually feel like I would be falsely representing Team Jacob if I were harping on this and saying, I can't believe this is the Jacob you guys are in love with because I am fully aware of the fact that this is not the Jacob you guys are in love with. You guys love New Moon Jacob, Jacob before he turns into a werewolf, the Jacob that really bonded with Bella. Ironically enough, that is also the Jacob that Bella loves. And he shows up every once in a while in this book, but for the most part, we get this asshole version of Jacob who cannot take no for an answer and fully turns into an assaulter. So I want to be very clear that when I criticize Jacob here, I'm not necessarily criticizing the Team Jacob girlies because I understand that you guys don't approve of his behavior either. This scene made me so mad. Oh my goodness. It made me so mad for like layers and layers and layers of reasons, okay? There's obviously just the fact that it happened, ew, oh my god, gross. But sometimes bad things happen in books, right? I don't have a problem with bad things happening to characters in books as long as they are addressed properly. My issue is that I do not think that Stephanie Meyer wrote this very well. So we're just going to go through all of it, okay? Jacob kisses Bella without Bella's permission. She punches him. She ends up breaking her hand. Jacob fully still cannot internalize the fact that he has attacked her, despite the fact that Bella, in this moment, fully understands that she has been assaulted by Jacob and is very uncomfortable and is very upset. She immediately wants to be driven home. She wants to go to the Cullens' house, but Jacob is driving her to Charlie's, where Charlie finds out that this happened because she 
he finds out that Bella's hand is broken. Charlie congratulates Jacob. Yes, Bella's dad claps this boy on the back for kissing her daughter without her permission. L for Charlie. Can we get an L for Charlie, everybody? What the fuck? I do think that Stephanie Meyer kind of perfectly nails the awkwardness of sometimes having to have conversations between a father and daughter that neither the father or daughter want to have. And I appreciate those scenes, but this is so unrealistic in my opinion. If I were dating a boy that my dad hated and there was another boy in my life that my dad really liked and he wanted me to date that boy. And then he found out that the boy that he liked kissed me without my permission. My my dad would beat that boy's ass so fast. Edward seems to be the only one who understands the gravity of this besides Bella and is as upset as Bella is and is supportive of her in her anger at Jacob. Even so, I feel like Edward handles this somewhat perfectly because he does not get physical with Jacob. Now, the reasoning is, of course, because this would break the treaty, but also because he knows that it would upset Bella and his main focus is not upsetting Bella. He wants to get her out of there safely without hurting her further and he knows that hurting Jacob would hurt her. And I I'm back on the Edward train. I'm sorry, you guys, I am. Because you know what? We can allow people to learn and grow. And he learned and he grew and he changed for Bella and he became less controlling and he was allowing Bella to see Jacob up until Bella did not want to see Jacob anymore herself because of Jacob's actions. And even then did not give in to his carnal desire to rip this man to pieces and attending to her needs in the moment, which was to get her out of there safely and get her to Carlisle, who could then set her broken hand. Stephanie Meyer tries to retcon this whole Charlie situation by later having Charlie ask Bella if she wasn't punching properly and offering to teach her how to throw a proper punch. He obviously doesn't understand at this point that Jacob is a werewolf and so a measly human could not punch him in the face and do any damage. So he assumes that Bella punched him properly and that's how she ended up hurting her hand and he offers to teach her how to punch properly and Bella says I thought you liked Jacob I thought you liked Jacob for me I thought you liked the fact that he kissed me without my permission Charlie and Charlie is like well I do like Jacob for you but I do also think that if a boy kisses you without your permission then you have a right to make your feelings heard that makes it worse I'm sorry but it did it made it worse it made it worse for me I felt even worse about it afterwards because that shows me that Stephanie Meyer understands that what Jacob did was assault and she proves through a lot of how Bella thinks about Jacob afterwards a lot of her reaction to him, a lot of how she thinks of him, seems to prove the fact that she understands that what Jacob did here was sexual assault. And it's crazy to me. And yet, nobody seems to care but Bella and Edward. And then she tries to retcon it with this whole Charlie thing, and I just don't believe it. It's so akin to the first book, where people say that Edward is really an emotional manipulator with that book, and I agree with that, especially in the beginning. And Bella's reaction to Edward's emotional manipulation is very similar to how that kind of emotional emotional manipulation would actually impact somebody. Stephanie Meyer has shown her ability to understand this and yet has shown it within a romantic relationship. That seems to have happened again. Like Stephanie Meyer seems to understand how this action from Jacob would have affected their friendship and is able to show a very realistic reaction from a reaction from Bella in her mind on how she would think of Jacob after this. And yet Jacob is not really painted as the bad guy in the overarching narrative for doing this. Bella hates him. Edward hates him but nobody else cares including Bella's dad and you know now that I speak this out loud I guess especially back then but still happening now there certainly are boys that this sort of action would be completely ignored for and people would just be like oh he was just making a move whatever whatever so in a way I guess that's realistic I think it's just specifically her dad not being mad about it that drives me crazy my dad would have been mad enough to find out I kissed a boy in high school let alone to find out that I didn't want to when I did and it felt icky made worse by the fact that it happens, wouldn't you guess it, a second time. Except this time he doesn't physically assault her, he manipulates her. There's a battle. We'll get into it. But Jacob's about to go off to the battle and he essentially threatens to throw himself into a dangerous enough situation that he is almost sure to die within this battle if Bella doesn't kiss him. So functionally, he threatens to kill himself if Bella does not kiss him. So she does kiss him and then her body reacts and this confuses her. This is also a very standard reaction from sexual assault victims. Bella is then, in my opinion, confused into thinking that she romantically loves Jacob because she feels feelings for him of some kind and and her body did react when he was kissing her and so this must mean that she loves him again somehow perfectly capturing how somebody might react to this situation but not painting it as a bad thing instead painting it as Bella actually feeling like she fell in love with Jacob 
Bella does love Jacob. This is not new information, but her love for him is platonic. She has no interest in a romantic relationship with him. She has interest in spending time with him as a family member, as a brother. She wants to be friends with him. She has been making clear to him for multiple books that what she wants from him is a friendship. She has never led him on. She has never once said to him that there's any potential for there to be anything romantic between them. She loves him, but the love is platonic and it has been very clear to be platonic not just with her words but we're inside of her mind we read her opinion of him and we know that her love for him is platonic a victim's body sometimes react to assaults her reacting to jacob kissing her does not mean that she secretly has romantic feelings for jacob she was still assaulted. And I just, reading all the rest of the whole conversation where she's like, is it better knowing that I know now that I do love you? I just love Edward more. Guys, what? Oh my God, it made me so mad. It made me so mad. It made me so angry. It made me so mad for Bella. She deserves so much better than that. And not that Edward was perfect in this book, certainly. Throughout the entire beginning, I also wanted to kill him. But Edward changed. Edward understands now that what he did to her was wrong. He apologizes to her for it. And then he swears he's going to change his ways. And then he does. And not only that, but he admits that it was out of jealousy and not out of an actual concern for her safety. And that actually she probably is pretty safe on the reservation with the werewolves. And the reason that he feels like she isn't is because he feels jealous. He admits this, he apologizes for it, and then he changes his behavior. That is all we can ask in people, okay? Does that make it better? Better that he did it originally? No. The difference between these two things is really important to me, and I really want to capture why I think these two things within the book are so different. What Edward does is painted the entire book as bad. Everybody understands that it's bad. Bella understands that it's bad. She's angry with him. She's trying to get around him. He eventually grows to understand that his behavior is not out of concern for Bella's safety, but instead is out of jealousy. He apologizes to her and he promises to change his ways and then he does. Meaning from an author perspective, from Stephanie Meyer's perspective in writing this book, she has never framed Edward's actions as proper or smart or a good thing to do or a nice thing to do to the reader. The reader the entire time understands that Edward is in the wrong for what he does. Edward admits he was in the wrong. Edward apologizes. Edward swears not to do it again. Jacob, on the other hand, he does it. He's congratulated for doing it. Bella's mad about it. Edward's mad about it, but nobody else is mad about it. Jacob never gets any repercussions for it. The entire rest of the book happens. Jacob swears he's not going to do it again, but then he fully actually does, except instead of a physical assault, this time it's more of an emotional assault and a manipulation thing. Once again, I'd like to remind you, he threatens to kill himself if she will not kiss him. She kisses him, her body reacts to the kiss, and all of a sudden there's this invented narrative that she secretly did love him. And Jacob admits at the end that he is happy that he pursued this to the end because he feels like he always would have wondered what her choice would have been if she had realized that she loved him. Meaning that from an author perspective, from a message of the book perspective, Stephanie Meyer is painting Jacob's actions as, in a way, eventually positive. In the moment, Belle is really upset, and we, the reader, are upset for her, but eventually, Jacob's actions become justified. In a way, the ends justify the means. Eventually, Bella did realize that she has feeling, feelings for him, feelings for him, and this justifies everything that Jacob did to prove to her that she has feelings for him. We always talk about this book series and the danger that it is to young women and what it teaches them is normal in relationships. But why do we not talk about the danger of young men reading this book and coming away with the message that it is okay to both physically and emotionally assault a woman and ignore the fact that she is telling you no because the ends justify the means and Jacob this whole time has this delusion that she's in love with him and is pursuing this delusion despite the fact that none of Bella's actions show this, none of her words show this, we're inside of her head and we know that she doesn't think this, he pursues this for the entire book and then eventually is essentially rewarded for that. He gets what he wanted, which is that Bella realizes that maybe on some level she had some romantic feelings for him, maybe. What are we teaching people with that? disgusting. And just to be clear, I'm not coming at you team Jacob girlies because again, I've read the subreddit. I know that you guys very firmly in the camp that New Moon Jacob is awesome and Eclipse Jacob sucks and I'm 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 with you there. Listen, you guys are all in that camp and I'm camping with you. I'm sitting by the campfire, I'm playing the guitar with you. New Moon Young Jacob is a lot more fun. This Jacob sucks ass and not in a good way, although we've seen that he would force that on Bella if he could. Okay. 
Last thing I want to mention about the relationships that are in this book, which is the eventual resolution of the whole marriage thing. Bella decides that there is one human experience that she does want to have before she's turned into a vampire, and that's sex. She wants to have sex with Edward before she gets turned into a vampire because she wants to have that experience. Edward at first is really adamant that they cannot do that because he is also going to be enjoying this interaction and he is worried about his ability to control himself because Bella is so fragile and if he is not careful then he could really hurt her. She wears him down through a little good old-fashioned makeout sesh, which is also not great, but honestly just par for the course for this book at this point. She's making out with him and being like, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Don't do that. Don't do that, kids. Eventually, he admits, of course, that he does physically want to do this with her, but it's the safety concern. And also, he's old-fashioned. He's from 1917, remember? Or that's when he gets transformed into a vampire. I don't remember. Don't comment. I don't care. I don't care. He was either born in 1917 or he was turned into a vampire in 1917 and it doesn't matter. He's from the early 1900s and so he's old fashioned and he wants to be properly married to Bella before they bone. I have mixed feelings about this. Stephanie Meyer is Mormon and she's very proudly Mormon and so I think the likelihood that she was going to show premarital sex in her young adult novel is probably fairly low. I will admit to you guys I don't mind this. I don't mind this and I'm going to explain why and please bear with me until the very end. I understand that young women in our society are often very shamed for wanting to have sex. And this whole virtue thing is a big piece of it. And so Edward saying that he wants to protect both of their virtues is a little bit like, I get that. But I am a firm believer that each person has to do what they want to do, especially when it comes to the bedroom. If somebody wants to wait until marriage to have sex, then they are well within their right to ask for that within a relationship. If the person they're in a relationship with is not okay with that, then that is just a sign that the two of them aren't compatible. I don't have a problem with an individual deciding that they don't want to have sex before marriage. I have a problem with society imposing that on everybody. In this, Edward does not slut shame Bella for wanting to have sex. He does not embarrass her. He does not tell her that this is like gross of her or anything like that. He does cite that his reasoning for wanting to do it is related to virtue, but it's a decision he's making for himself. That decision does impact both of them, but they're in a relationship. And when people are in a relationship, sometimes a decision one of them makes affects both of them and the way their relationship works. If Bella's not okay with this, then she and Edward don't have to continue dating. But specifically because Edward doesn't slut shame her, I don't mind the fact that he wanted to wait until marriage because I think that that that's valid for an individual. I just don't like that that's forced on everybody in society. I also noted in either my first video or my second video about this, I can't remember, that I somewhat appreciate the representation of a teenage boy that is not super sex driven in his relationship. I think that that on some level can be a good thing for young girls to read, that boys can want to be in a fulfilling and loving relationship with them that does not involve sex, and that that can be something that a man actually wants because society really sells young girls on the idea that all men want is sex. So I don't mind this. I I honestly don't mind this. I don't think this is that bad. It was a little bit like, oh, okay, Stephanie Meyer's Mormon, but whatever. So Edward says, I will turn you into a vampire myself and I will bone you while you're human if you marry me first. And he insists that it doesn't have to be a big wedding. It just has to be some kind of official whatever, whatever. They could drive to Vegas. They could go to the courthouse. He does not care as long as they are married and then he will bone her and then turn her into a vampire. She agrees to this plan and they get engaged with the ugliest ring known to man. And it is described to look like this in the book. So I don't fault the movie designer people. Allison sees a vision that the two of them are going to run off to Vegas and get married and guilt trips Bella into having an actual wedding. I did not love this part. I think Bella should have the wedding that she wants to have. If her and Edward are both cool with going off to Vegas, then they should be able to do that and they should not be guilt tripped into not doing that by Edward's sister. However, Bella ends up conceding that it would be a good farewell to her human life and all of her human connections. And so she agrees to have a full white wedding and to let Alice plan it. Although she makes Alice promise that she's not going to go super overboard and Alice insists that eventually, Bella is going to thank her for it, which we presume Alice can actually see the future and see, though she does have incentive to lie in this situation. Open question. Do you guys think Edward ever jerked off as a vampire? Follow-up question. If you do, do you think it was before he met Bella or 
afterwards. Edward remarks at many points through this book series that he has just as much attraction to Bella as Bella does to him, but he has to exert some self-control because he is worried about hurting her. He won't let their makeout sessions get too intense because he does find her to be attractive and he is worried about getting too horny, as the kids might say, and his more rational mind not stopping him from allowing their interaction to continue into a more sexual realm. And it just kind of led me to wonder, do you think he ever like went home from her house and jerked off? I don't know why I'm curious about that. I mean, I know he's fictional, so like he never did any of this. These were just words on a page that we read and imagined it happening. But philosophically, from a character perspective, do you guys think Edward ever jerked it after he and Bella met? Truly one of life's great mysteries. Finally, we have some of the vampire plot to talk about. This, like I said, took a back burner to most of the main plot, which is the love triangle. Let's be honest, Stephanie Meyer knows her audience. She knows what you're there for. So we're mostly dealing with the love triangle and in the background, there's all these rumblings of this murder spree and possibly Victoria coming back and it all comes together eventually. Long story short, Victoria puts together a newborn vampire army in Seattle and then takes that army to confront the Cullens. Her hope is that the army will distract the Cullens enough that she can sneak past their defenses and kill Bella while Edward is trying to kill out this newborn army. They figure out her plot and Bella was hiding on a mountain with Edward and Seth, which is one of the werewolves. When Victoria and one of her newborns stumble upon Edward and Seth and Bella, obviously, and Edward and Seth take down Victoria and Riley, I believe his name is, the newborn. To teach us about the newborn army, Stephanie Meyer gives us Jasper's backstory. Oh boy, if you've never heard this, buckle up. So Jasper was turned into a vampire in the 1860s. He was added to a newborn vampire army where he fought in turf wars for a very long time. He was really good at, you know, corralling the troops, being a bit of a general, if you will. And eventually he voluntarily leaves and Alice finds him at a diner. She has seen their future together and she goes and finds him and they become mates. Why is Jasper such a good general? I'm so glad you asked. Turns out, you you guys remember what else happened in the 1860s? Do you know, do you remember what major American event happened in the 1860s? Jasper is ma making his way up the ranks of an army in the American Civil War. Do you want to guess which one? Do you want to guess which army that he was fully and voluntarily and happily a part of? I'll give you one guess. Go, guess. The Confederacy, you're correct. This man is a part of the Confederacy, and here's the thing. I remembered this, obviously I remembered this being a negative thing about this book. But upon the reread, I was truly shocked and alarmed by how little the relevancy of which army he was in applies. He talks about this newborn army thing being a thing in the South. So if I were to give Stephanie Meyer the benefit of the doubt, which I'm not going to do for very much longer, so please don't come for me. Maybe she felt like he had to be Confederate if she wanted this turf war to be happening in the South, but some of these battles happened in the South. So I don't understand why he couldn't have been a part of the Northern Army that had maybe like traveled to the South to have some of these battles. And then they could have just been in a battle in the South when he got turned into a vampire and that would have been fine. She also could have chosen the Revolutionary War because some of that also happened in places in the South. The actual relevancy of him being Confederate versus Northern or her picking a different war, like none of it matters. There's no reason why he has to be a Confederate for the plot to make sense. Not only that, but at no point does anybody say, oh, by the way, he's changed his ways and he doesn't believe slavery should be legal anymore. That's never said. It's never even explicitly addressed. He just mentions that he was in the Confederate army and then the rest of his backstory happens. He gets turned into a vampire and we never talk about the confederacy again we never should have talked about the confederacy to begin with why is this in this book like i said if you wanted him to be a general he could have been a part of the north or he could have like it could have been the revolutionary war like why did you pick the civil war why did you pick the confederates i'm talking to you directly now stephanie this is so weird and not only that but why did you do that and then never retcon it and never have him say anything about it he never says anything about disagreeing with why the civil war happened or anything like that it's bringing a the war was about states rights energy that i just don't really appreciate how are you not like i just i don't get it i don't get the choice i don't understand why it had to happen and much like pretty much anybody else who's talked about this 
I'm upset about it and it shouldn't have been done. We also get Rosalie's backstory, which is horrific, first of all. And second, really only exists to attempt to convince Bella to stay human, but specifically to establish that as a human, Bella can get pregnant, while the vampires cannot get pregnant. Is that foreshadowing? Who's to say? Completely unrelated. We also find out that there's this whole imprinting things with the werewolves which is when they see somebody and they fall in love with them at first sight and it's way stronger than love and basically their entire world just goes to revolve around that person and that person is like the center of their everything after that and it's this thing called imprinting and it's established in this book that it is possible to imprint on somebody who is very young when a member of the werewolf group imprints on a two-year-old is that also foreshadowing I truly could not tell you. Unrelated things, by the way, unrelated things about humans getting pregnant and the werewolves imprinting. Those things, nothing to do with each other. Don't think about it too hard. Lastly, the other thing that matters is that the Volturi appear at the very end, which seems kind of random, but I do think it exists with a purpose. The Volturi essentially show up in theory to get rid of this newborn army because it's something they don't allow because it makes it really obvious that there are vampires around and the humans start to get suspicious because so many humans are dying. So the Volturi show up in theory to take care of the newborn army, but they somehow perfectly show up right after the battle ends. This, in my opinion, serves to establish the fact that the Volturi on some level want to take out the Cullens. Edward says this in almost as many words, saying that Arrow, who's kind of like the leader of the Volturi or one of the leaders, is a little bit threatened by Carlisle because Carlisle's coven is the biggest one in the world outside of the Volturi. The vampires are very instinctual creatures and they struggle to get along in groups. They don't like group projects. And so it's very hard for a big group of vampires to live in harmony. The only reason the Volturi are able to do it are because they're essentially the most powerful coven in the world and everybody wants to be a part of it. So the people who are a part of it play nice so they don't get destroyed by the Volturi themselves. The only reason the Cullens are able to do it is because they've decided to drink animal blood instead of human blood. And it's really like a chicken or an egg thing. Like, are they all of enough of like a temper? emotional state I don't know what I'm saying to all get along and that also makes it so that none of them want to drink human blood or is it the fact that they don't drink human blood and that they sustain themselves off of animal blood that makes them more tame I don't know but either way the Volturi are very threatened by Carlisle and their coven and it's implied that it's possible that they wanted some of the Cullens to die in this whole thing in order to weaken this coven a little bit especially because Arrow is very very interested in both Edward and Alice's power Hours. Alice can see the future and Edward can p- read people's minds from a distance. Arrow can read somebody's entire life history, but he has to be touching them to do it. So Arrow has expressed interest in the past book in both Alice and Edward's powers. So that's why the Volturi show up at the very, very end of the book. It also allows them to kind of push forward the like, hey, you've got to turn Bella into a vampire soon. Remember, eventually we're not going to be so patient. Eventually we're going to come in and kill her if you don't turn her into a vampire and maybe kill some of you too. So just get on that, please. Is any of this also foreshadowing for the events of Breaking Dawn? Up to you. The only other important thing that happens is that one of the newborns is named Bree and she surrenders but still gets killed by the Volturi. I only mention that because one of the bonus books in the Twilight series is about that character and I plan on reading all of the Twilight books for this video series including those books. I've never read them before so I'm actually kind of excited about that. So I just thought I'd mention it here so that it doesn't just like come out of nowhere when I go to read that book and it isn't a character I've ever mentioned. Her name is Brie and she's in this book and she's a newborn vampire that was a part of the army that actually surrendered instead of fighting, but she still gets killed by the Volturi. And that's Eclipse. All in all, what did I think? Fantastic question. I have so, so, so many thoughts. So many thoughts and feelings. This was my favorite book in this series. I thought it was the most entertaining. The whole like Edward versus Jacob thing. Edward being all jealous. Them getting all steamy. And Edward being like, no, we can't. I loved it. I ate it up. 12-year-old me was having the time of her life flipping these pages. And even up to this day, I would have said Eclipse is my favorite book in the initial four book series. I stand by the fact that I think Eclipse is the most entertaining book in this series and subjectively is still my favorite. However, I'm not just reading these books for my subjective opinion. I'm also reading them for my objective opinion. And in my objective opinion, this is the worst book of the three. This is the most disjointed. This is the one where the plot makes the least sense. The events of the entire book are just structured very strange. There's all this danger kind of brewing in the background, which can be very exciting at times. But because Bella isn't that consistently worried about it, we, the reader, lose our worry for it as well. 
So it doesn't really serve to build the tension super well. I also thought it's weird. Like I didn't realize that they didn't realize until just before the actual attack happened that it was Victoria being a part of it. Like from their perspective within the book, Victoria shows up at the beginning and then the rest of the book happens and they somehow don't put together that all the weird stuff happening in Seattle and the fact that this army might come for them in Forks has anything to do with Victoria who just showed up at the beginning of the book. It just kind of makes them look kind of stupid. Also the fact that the references to Wuthering Heights are the laziest of any of the literary references within this entire series. I thought Twilight itself was actually incredibly well written upon my reread as an adult. I then thought that New Moon was a little bit less cohesive. It's a Romeo and Juliet retelling very loosely. And I thought the references to Romeo and Juliet were there, but I felt like it wasn't as strong a literary work as Twilight was. I feel even more so in Eclipse that the, the actual, re like the literary quality of it is just worse than the first two books. We're going downhill. I'm a little bit worried to pick up Breaking Dawn. I have not spoiled it for myself. I have not looked at what the quote is at the beginning. So I do not know what the reference is going to be, but I am afraid. We've gotten worse and worse as we've gone and I know the plot of Breaking Dawn loosely. And so I'm just, I'm terrified that we're just gonna keep spiraling out of control. So to reiterate, I think this book is the most entertaining in the series and subjectively it is my favorite. But objectively, I think it is the worst written of the three that I have reread thus far. But never fear, that will not stop me. I will continue this series. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I had so, so much fun making it. Let me know what you guys think down below. Let me know what you think of the lighting. I am very open to criticism. Kind criticism, please be nice. But also please tell me where I should put these lights to make it look better than this. Thank you. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I appreciate you guys and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.